Welcome everybody to the final roundtable uh, discussion. I would ask all the roundtable panel members to put their video on, then we'll be able to see everyone. Uh, I'll hand over to Claire, who will give us some housekeeping before we get going. For the last time, you'll be glad to know. Um, hello everyone, it is nearly time for the Q&A, so just if um, you have any questions, for our speakers, please put um, these this in the Q&A box and we will try our very best uh, to answer as many questions as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claire. So we now move on to the roundtable uh, discussion, as was mentioned um, earlier. Um, the format I want to follow this is I'll go around the table, introduce uh, all of the uh, panellists um, and then I'll ask each one of them um, a question, which I've already prepared, uh, and then we'll go on to the um, to an open uh, question session. So keep those questions coming in, and we'll see what we can do uh, to, to answer them. So the first person on my list is Duncan uh, Booker. Duncan is with the, the a manager at the Glasgow City Council. He's the COP26 stakeholder manager at the Glasgow City Council, um, and he's working on the arrangements for COP26, and he's led to the city committing to achieve, uh, or his work has led to the city achieve, uh, committing to achieve carbon neutrality by the year 2030. Uh, Ken, Alex, um, if Ken is there, I can see you on the list, but I don't see your video. Um, now, Ken will be joining us, and he is the uh, Director of Project Climate Change at the University of California, Berkeley. He's a senior my video advisor. is my video is disabled. Sorry to interrupt. This is Ken. Okay, Ken. I can't seem to get it on. Okay, now that's okay. Okay, well, as long as you're with us. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you. Um, so Ken is the director of, the, the, of Project Climate at the University of California, Berkeley. He's senior policy advisor, or was senior policy advisor to Governor Brown, and before that, he headed the environment section of the California Attorney General's office. Uh, we have Graham Roy with us. He's the director of the Fraser Valander Institute and head of the Department of Economics at the University of Strathclyde. Uh, Graham was a senior economic advisor to the Scottish Government and headed the First Minister's Policy Unit. Welcome, Graham. Um, we all have uh, Kirsty Bird. Hello, Kirsty. Kirsty is the Director of Energy and Climate Change at the Scottish Government. She's responsible for climate change, domestic and international uh, policy, energy, consumer issues, and water. Um, we've already met Alistair Manning uh, today. Uh, Alistair is a scientific ma manager at the Met Office, and as we heard, he models the atmospheric dispersion of materials. Uh, we also have uh, Ron Cohen joining us on the panel, and he's a professor of chemistry at the University of uh, California in Berkeley, and he applies experiment and modeling to understand the chemical composition of the Earth's atmosphere. And we also have met uh, Guy Brasseur, um, and he's from the Max Planck Institute for uh, Meteorology, and he researches in climate change, stratospheric uh, ozone depletion, global air pollution, solar and terrestrial interactions, and was a coordinating lead author for the fourth assessment report of the IPCC, uh, which was awarded the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. So welcome everyone. Um, and I'll start off by uh, asking a question of each of the panel members. I'll go with the ones that we haven't spoken uh, already. And I'm going to start with um, Duncan. So Duncan, um, what is the significance of Glasgow's role in delivering Scotland's uh, national climate change pledges and how does the GEM initiative uh, further Glasgow's emission goals? Thanks for your question, Alistair. And it's a real privilege to be on the webinar uh, today. I I've had the great pleasure of being able to observe the uh, work of the GEM initiative uh, globally and here in Glasgow from inception to its uh, deployment this month on, on our school roofs. So it it's, been a it's been a real privilege. So thank you for having me. And, and thank you especially to our, our friends from both Strathclyde University locally and more globally from our at two universities in the Bay Area in California. Uh, I suppose the principal answer to your question I want to give, Alistair, is one of the key messages that Glasgow wants to get to the out to the world as host city for COP26. Uh, it's simply that whilst nation states make pledges around carbon and climate, 
or sometimes I'm afraid to say don't agree all that much, it is cities that are delivering. Uh, and we've become an urban species, uh, humanity. Uh, so the many ways the solutions to the crises we now face will have to be found in our cities. I often say that somehow our cities manage simultaneously to be both the locus of, but also I believe the sustainable solution to many of the world's problems around climate, injustice uh, and quality of life. Uh, and what we're seeing at the moment is the overlapping, I think, of three crises from the COVID crisis, which we had not foreseen, to the climate emergency, which we knew to be looming over us, and overlapping again with a crisis globally of racial injustice, which has been around far, far longer than the other two. And in many ways, I think it's those town gown partnerships that Sir Jim referred to in his opening remarks that will help us find some of the solutions to these incredible challenges. Uh, I can give you no more profound an example of that tangibly than the fact that the United Kingdom's target year for carbon neutrality is 2045. That's set to 2040 for Scotland in virtue of its uh, greater assets and, and progress. And Glasgow, through our own climate emergency declaration, has set sail for a 2030 target year for carbon neutrality with all the challenges that means. But it also means that Glasgow's achievements uh, will lead to Scotland's success. Uh, and that's really important. We genuinely believe that we're in this together in terms of partnerships locally, nationally and globally. Uh, and the work that we've been hearing about today, and I've really been touched by some of the presentations I've been able to listen into, uh, will help us in Glasgow, if you'll forgive the pun, uh, immeasurably uh, to begin to not only monitor, <laughs> but also to assess progress in the local policies uh, that we put in place, supported especially in this part of the world by a very supportive uh, national policy framework, which uh, you know is, is not to be assumed elsewhere. Uh, and in many ways, I think it's that town gown asset that we have in places like Glasgow that we can draw upon that leads to that incredible sort of he helix of research, policy and practice going together. And if we do that right, then I believe that cities can become the same sort of crucible of innovation that we once were for the first industrial age of great universities, innovative businesses, and I hope also from my uh, role, a, a supportive public sector. Uh, and we've seen some of the changes that can take place through that much more supportive framework. Uh, people say a week is a long time in politics. Well, we've, we've certainly seen perhaps a more supportive global framework emerging uh, over that last week in particular. And I think Glasgow is at its best as many of our cities are, when we manage to ally and align innovation and technology and data along with ambitions for social policy. And it's that particular link which I've seen very strongly with the GEM work locally, but also learning more about the global aspects of the work, some of the presentations having touched upon that, uh, for us to create a better urban quality of life, to play our part in reducing emissions, to adapt to the impacts of climate change, which obviously is the other side of the of the carbon coin in many respects, uh, and to build social justice too. And we can only do that if we can measure progress. Um, we, we cannot counter that which we cannot count. And in the instance of the GEM work, it, it gives us an opportunity to engage in a public conversation. I, I was touched by David Miller's comment. I wrote it down. He said a granular neighborhood scale data. That's going to be really significant, improving to our people that what we're doing is making a difference and is benefiting their work. And as, as a general principle, I would also argue that such data should be open in order to allow for an engaged civic conversation, just as Scottish air quality data is available on a website you can pick up uh, as I speak as well. Just finally, one of the things I always say is that to the extent that the spotlight of the world will be upon Glasgow for COP26, so much more so will the gaze of Glaswegians be upon their city. And we need to prove that social justice, a high urban quality of life, and reduced emissions and climate resilient city all go together. And, and Glasgow, whilst not perfect, is in that respect, I think, ideal as COP host city, because the challenges we have of vacant derelict land of a post-industrial legacy are the same that many of the cities of the world will grapple over. And those cities, some of which are on the call here today, I think are going to be the sustainable means by which we deliver that better future and also make sure that at COP26 national ambitions can be real can gain traction and can be delivered on thanks alistair yeah, thanks very much uh, duncan that, that was uh, quite uh, in, uh, inspirational ken i wonder if i can turn to to you now uh, so ken uh, what do you see as the barriers to utilizing new low-cost monitoring networks and how can this information be uh, gathered 
uh, be delivered in a way that's most useful to policymakers? Well, <clears throat> thank you, Alistair. And let me echo uh, Duncan's thanks for being part of this. And uh, uh, you've asked me a fairly specific question. So let me give you a fairly specific answer. Um, first, there, there are a series of barriers uh, to use this uh, information. Um, the first is uh, just getting uh, cities and, and decision and policy makers up to speed that the potential uh, exists. Um, that is no small thing. I would imagine even in California, um, in, in the area where uh, Ron works, uh, very few of the cities uh, even there know the availability of uh, some of the low cost monitors that he's been working on. Um, second, uh, and I'm sure this is uh, true, particularly um, in some of the developing uh, countries. Um, staffing is uh, a serious issue. Uh, everybody, all these cities have serious budget problems. Uh, everybody's uh, overwhelmed with COVID and a series of other sets of issues. How do we integrate this information uh, and data into a way and, and, and have staff time to, to work on it? Um, what uh, many of the cities, I, I think, probably are going to need help with how you place instruments. They need expertise to understand uh, what the uh, what the value of the instruments is, what it can monitor, and what it cannot. Um, and then I, I think then we get to a real serious uh, set of issues: uh, the capacity to handle the data and to interpret it. Um, having daily sets of uh, information potentially, um, understanding what it means, um, kind of getting uh, signal and noise right. Um, these are serious sets of issues that are going to require some additional resources and help. Um, and then uh, concern about data, uh, uh, what, what is it going to show? Um, it, there are serious political ramifications when you determine, uh, for example, that a particular uh, area of the city is being severely impacted by certain types of pollution. Um, what does that mean from a city budget perspective? How do you deal with that set of problems and, and how are policymakers going to confront it? The second part of your, the, the second part of your question, I, I, these, it, it, it's a whole new world here with uh, uh, talking into an iPad and playing with microphones. Sorry about that. Um, uh, the second part of your question is uh, what info information would be useful to policymakers? Um, and uh, I, I think there's quite a, a huge amount. Um, first of all, uh, we need to identify what the monitoring can and can't do. Um, and uh, uh, what are the limitations of this data I think are as important as what it, what it will provide. Um, we, we have to have a, a realistic understanding of uh, the costs time and expertise, kind of getting back to some of my earlier points. Um, and we have to uh, figure out who can make the decision to implement. Um, that's, uh, uh, as some, those of you who connected to government uh, understand, that's not always an easy decision. Um, and then finally, uh, how does the jurisdiction, how does the information help the jurisdiction um, and what are the actions that need to follow from that information? The, these are uh, not easy, uh, e easily determined. Um, I think there's a city uh, uh, that Ron has done some work with here in the Bay Area called Richmond. It's uh, got an oil refinery um, and it has lots of uh, flaring and air pollution sets of issues. Well, we have a lot of data from that city um, and yet uh, it has not always been used in a way that uh, I, I think a lot of particularly community members and activists would like. Um, it hasn't necessarily uh, reduced emissions to the point uh, that, that the population is uh, un, without impacts. So there are challenges, it's, it's the essential piece of course is to get the data to have transparency, to use that as, a, as the way to move forward uh, but then we need to, to also figure out how we're going to respond and, and uh, what it means to, to apply that data. 
So this is a, a, a quick tidbit. I'm sure there's more to say, but uh, uh, with that, I'll send it back to you. Uh, thanks very much for that, uh, Ken. Um, I'd like now to, to welcome uh, uh, Kirsty. Uh, so Kirsty, um, given your uh, responsibility, uh, what role do you see for cities in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and dealing with the effects of climate change? Can you unmute? You need to unmute yourself, Kirsty. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Excellent. And hopefully see me as well. Um, I'll, I'll answer your question in a second, but like others, I just like to say I am really pleased to be um, invited uh, along to the the panel today. Unlike others, I haven't been involved in GEM up until now. It is one of the perils of my job and such a wide remit that there's lots of things I should be involved in and know about that I haven't. Um, but I, I actually, I'm usually, I've taken the whatever two hours we've had now to, to actually listen to a lot of the presentations and I have thoroughly enjoyed it. We could end up speaking to a lot of other civil servants in the civil service. And I have learned more today, I think, than I've learned <laughs> in the last week. So, so it's, it's actually been great. It's also, it's also fantastic to see the collaboration between um, well, California and, and Scotland in this case, and indeed wider, wider partners, it's quite an international crowd here. Um, and it's, it's great actually, we've been um, collaborating, as the, as the minister said up front, we've been collaborating quite a lot with California. I was speaking to the, um, one of the energy commissioners, um, Andrew McAllister, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about hydrogen and hydrogen opportunities because we see a lot of them in, in Scotland as well. Um, and it's just so heartening, as, as Mary Nichols said up front, to, to hear that the conversation in the US, the, the state level and federal conversations have already um, started. You know, it's, it's fantastic. Um, it's, it's really good to hear that. The, the final thing, I will get to the question, Thomas. Um, but the final thing I wanted to say was I was struck just by, by um, some of the presentations of the values of visualising some of this. I think Ken, Ken talked about it. So for policymakers, and when we talk about greenhouse gas emissions, it tends to be at national level. And it's kind of hard sometimes to make it feel very, very real. But when you see it um, being about a city, um, you know, in my case, uh, Glasgow, I've just spotted one of your monitors is just up the road, I think, at Notre Dame High School. Have I got that right? Yeah, anyway, <laughs> you can make that clear in the, the, the chat. But, but it just makes it really, really real um, to see real-time data in your locality. And back to Duncan's point about, about granularity. Um, so, so that's great. Final point I'll say um, in terms of, of general points is it just feels like, again, back to the graphics points and, and the fact that we are... The, the international collaboration I've seen through through today's sessions is there's just clearly such an opportunity to showcase the value of that. This is this is such a concrete example of that, which I think a lot of people like me coming a little bit new to it will find really inspiring and, and interesting. So we should just think about, I'm sure you are thinking about this, how, how we showcase that. Back to your exam question. <laughs> so so what's, the, what's the role of cities in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and, and dealing with the impact of climate change? Um, so cities clearly have a huge role to play um, in, in, in terms of the action they, they take to mitigate greenhouse gases. I think Duncan put it well by pointing out that the cities have, have really early greenhouse gas emission uh, dates in Scotland, 2030. There's a nice competition going on amongst our cities indeed, particularly tents between Glasgow and Edinburgh, which is, is good to see. I was, I, I wanted, I'd written a line saying, um, in Scotland, cities uh, account for X percent of Scottish emissions, and I asked my team to fill it in. And in the time I gave them, they couldn't actually do that. Um, but I will do that after. And I was listening very carefully to one of the presentations, and I don't think we had a UK figure. But I'm going to do that now after this. And if anybody knows that number, if they could put it on the chat, that would be that would be great. Um, people know, I think most... Um, most folks in the UK and we know that the challenging greenhouse gas emission targets we have in Scotland, the minister talked about them, 2045, uh, net, zero 20, uh, net zero 2045, but particularly 75% um, reduction by 2030. We've got a really um, impressive track record in Scotland. We've reduced greenhouse gas emissions by almost 50% on 1990 levels. Um, but we've done the easy part, which is changing big power stations. They're mostly um, wind now. We've, we've moved over heavily to renewable energy, reflecting our, our natural resources in Scotland. So, you know, our, our track record, record is fantastic, but the future is tough because the transformational change that, that needs to happen to do 
rest of the 50% um, is, is going to touch on every part of, of people's lives. Um, so on cities, again, this is reflecting, I, I was going to say the key um, areas for emission reductions in cities is, is on transport, buildings, so heat and energy efficiency, low carbon and waste. Um, but then I saw one, one of the slides presenting data saying, well, actually it depends. <laughs> it depends if you've got a big power station in your city. So, but I think for most cities, the focus tends to be around these areas. And there's some really good work going on in, in Scotland to do the Scottish Cities Alliance. This is, is a group where the, the seven cities in Scotland work together with the Scottish government and other partners to look at the key priorities on decarbonisation and how we deliver them. And there's, there's kind of four core projects, transport, the, the two on buildings and waste as part of that. I'll just give you a, a, a quick flavour of some of the things that are happening in the, the transport and, um, and building sides in, in Scotland, and we can, can follow up these a bit and questioning. So, so I, one of the key things we're doing is um, that we need to do in cities and more generally is, is in transport is shifting from, from cars to buses. This, it, you know, this has, a, has greenhouse gas benefits, but it also has social benefits and congestion benefits. And in a place like Glasgow, people from poorer areas tend to be reliant on bus transport. In Scotland, um, one in three households don't have a car. So, so this shift onto uh, public transport and bus transport is, is really important and, and very much so in, in cities. And we've just provided um, 500 million uh, of, of investment in bus priority infrastructure to reduce congestion and help people get onto buses. Susan Aitken mentioned our um, low emission zones. So we're bringing that in in, in, in the largest cities in, in Scotland. They will play a key part in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and also um, addressing other air quality issues. Uh, we're also you know, working with local authorities and private partners to support um, EV infrastructure. We recognize car cars still will be in towns, um, but um, you know, we, we are, are looking to shift to um, uh, electric as quick as we can do. But final thing on transport, we're also looking to build on some of the behaviours that have changed in positive ways um, as a result of COVID. And the two, two examples of this, one is, is around um, the, the 20 minute neighbourhood. So we are looking at, you know, again, working with relevant local authorities and cities, looking at what action we can take to encourage people uh, to, to be in, in, in more in the local vicinity. So setting up, investing in um, uh, in, in more local workplaces. I think our trial here is in Inverness in Scotland, um, where we are um, repurposing existing buildings into, into hubs, um, because there's a lot of momentum now around um, uh, sort of 20 minute cities or being able to do more, more local, at least in, in areas where that's feasible, and that includes cities. And um, the other big area that has, has changed uh, it, as a result of COVID is, is around active travel. So people did walk, have been walking more, have been on um, their bikes more. So we're looking to encourage this investing about 500 million. I've gone way over my um, limit. So I'll just say a couple of things around heat and, heat, heat and energy efficiency. So um, our, our ambition at the national level for decarbonisation and heat and efficiency is, is huge. Um, we will need 90% of our housing stock to be uh, um, low car lower zero carbon by 2045. Um, about half of that almost by 2030. And um, there's a couple of things that are, are key for, for cities around here. The first is, so most, most of the heating in our cities are gas. And um, I was really struck speaking to the Californians that, that there's, there's a lot of gas domestic heating in California as well. I didn't know that until about six months ago, but, but it's very, very prevalent in, in Scotland and in the UK. And um, so, so where, where we can, um, shifting to, um, to uh, uh, um, heat networks, both for, for domestic um, buildings, but also, um, also non-domestics. Non the, other, the other key area around um, heat and energy efficiency in relation to um, uh, cities is, is the work we've been doing with, with them on um, local heat and energy efficiency um, plans so that cities and other local authorities are making plans for their areas which they know best about what which are the appropriate areas for things like district heating where where you know do we target energy efficiency measures first so that cities 
um, and I guess I'll, I'll maybe try and finish on this, this point actually. Cities have, as Duncan said, an incredible convening power. They have the local knowledge and um, the speed of the transformation that needs to happen and the scale of the transformation needs coordination and it needs some central planning. And cities have an absolutely critical role to play in that and bringing together all the, the, the parties to collaborate who, to, who, who need to deliver that. So I'll stop there. I'm happy to talk a bit about adaptation, which I didn't get to. Steve, thank you very much. That was a really very uh, interesting and comprehensive uh, answer. Um, it probably you've been spending too much time with politicians not answering the question at the beginning, but never mind. The, <laughs> one of the points that you did raise, which, I, which you, you, Kirsty and I spoke the, the other night, and she said, well, what, what, what did this California link uh, develop? And what I didn't say to Kirsty, but what the genuine answer is, well, you've got to go back to 1977 when I spent it, over a year there, made re the relationships and links. And I, I actually think this is really important in terms of people communication, people knowing one another, uh, and exchanging uh, ideas. It's one of the very unfortunate consequences of our inability to travel uh, these days so that we actually go and meet people in person, build up relationships. Uh, I'd like now to move on to Graham uh, Roy. Now, Graham is a, an economist, um, so we'll ask an economics uh, question. So, Graham, what impact do climate policies have across economic sectors, and how can economic models aid in determining the efficacy of climate change policies? Thank you, Alistair, and thank you very much for the invitation to come along and uh, speak tonight. And I like the way you introduced me as an economist. I thought you were going to ask me to apologise. Um, but so a, a few things. I mean, Duncan's already touched on this, I think, where um, the importance of, of economic policy, not just seen around climate change at a national level, but also a local and a subnational level as well. And that's where I think, you know, particularly our interests get really um, involved around all of this. And, and where I think it's really important is the, the importance of thinking about how, yes, these are important climate change issues and these are important things to do for the planet as a whole, but actually there's important economic implications of this and not just seeing this as economic cost, but actually an economic opportunity. And some of that's about how state policies and local policies can almost kind of have a role looking at the sectors at the coal face of, pardon the pun, around tackling climate change. So in the Scottish context, things like the transition away from carbon and North Sea oil into renewables, but also crucially, particularly for cities like Glasgow, is about thinking about how the sectors that you might not naturally think immediately being at the front end of the change to climate change are absolutely crucial to supporting that journey. So how do we get all businesses, how do we get all aspects of our economy moving in the direction of shifting towards low carbon and whether that be in terms of the, the supply chains, whether that be in terms of the way they engage with our customers and move their workforce around. Thinking all of that through is absolutely crucial, I think, to really understand how we can not just see climate change and the challenges, but actually the opportunities that come in for that. And that's where that alignment of national policies through to sub-state policies right the way through to local policies give us a real opportunity. And places like Glasgow, I think I've got so much to gain from, from the opportunities about how we shift through to um, tackling um, climate change and the opportunities that come from a low carbon economy and all of that. I think that's where, again, I think where economic modelling becomes absolutely crucial to all of this because it helps us understand these linkages between what's happening in the environment and what's then happening in the economy. So we can look at things like, well, what happens if we have uh, shocks to the natural environment? How might they impact through in terms of the economy? Are we, We've always understood that shocks outside the economy can have impacts. I think one lesson from 2020 is that we're now much more acute to factors outside our day-to-day -day economy causing mayhem to our um, economic structures, whether that be through public health, but through environmental health, uh, environmental health too. But it's really important we start to flip these questions around. And again, that's where the modeling and all the analysis that we're doing through GEM can be really powerful to think about well, where are the opportunities that we can come? What's the scale of investment that's required? How do we actually align all the various policy levers and private sector levers in a way where we can actually meet all these economic objectives, ambitions that we're trying to achieve? And as we touched on and we've heard already today and and um, I'm sure we'll touch on the Q&A. The key thing that underpins all of that is good quality data. And the more we can invest and improve on getting high quality data at a really local level, not only does that help communication and help us understand the challenges and opportunities better, but it also helps make policy better.
Thank you for that. Uh, I'm also trying to get used to the technology <laughs> and using an unusual computer. So thanks, thanks very much uh, for that, Graham. Uh, Alistair, maybe I can turn to, to you now. Uh, thanks for your talk um, earlier. I suppose the question that was going through my mind uh, really was, you know, do we really need a, a, a dense network of, of sensors uh, to identify sources of, of greenhouse gases? And you know, how useful is it to attribute greenhouse gases to particular sources? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, I'll be very brief because obviously I had a big slot of time earlier. Um, just to say really that you know, it, it certainly will be incredibly useful to be able to attribute greenhouse gas emissions to specific sources um, and sectors of, of the economy. We really need to know where, when and why emissions occur in order to be able to address them um, so we can understand uh, how to tackle the emissions, why they're occurring. Um, and um, so given the current network of sensors um, across the UK, which is what I'm more familiar with, um, it is possible to attribute uh, for a limited number of gases, uh, not CO2 at the moment, I would say. Um, uh, and, you know, for, you know, be, you know for some gases and for some sources, uh, because some sources are quite unique um, for, for, for particular gases. Um, so, you know, uh, for some of the uh, hydrofluorons and F gases, you know, you can attribute them to particular factories, you know, a large factory in a remote area is easy to see within modeling uh, context. But when you get, um, in terms of carbon dioxide, you get um, the biosphere uh, intermingled with uh, traffic intermingled with uh, uh, gas distribution networks, intermingled with uh, waste um, and all fossil, free, uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, sources. Um, I think in order to really understand that uh, within the context of a city and, and nationally, a lot more observations would be needed um, to crack the CO2 problem. So these, these sort of uh, low cost, high density networks are really the first step on that road and we really need to know how to interpret that data to make maximum use of it um, and, and, and hopefully then provide the information about where, when and why emissions occur. Thank you very much uh, yeah, for that, uh, Alistair. Uh, I'll maybe turn to, to Guy now, if, if that's okay. Uh, so Guy, um, I, I wonder if you could say something about um, you know, how coordinated networks of uh, uh, cities uh, sharing greenhouse gas emission data can assist in meeting the Paris Accord on greenhouse gas emissions? Well, I think uh, that, of course, uh, many cities are, are, are very uh, concerned about uh, the role they can play to, to contribute to, to the to Paris Accord. And I think that uh, in order to do that, we need, uh, and the cities need to have a, a much better uh, knowledge and understanding of the different pieces that play a role in, in the management of carbon in, in, in the urban uh, area. And so uh, I was really convinced by hearing uh, both uh, Alison and uh, also Ron about the, how powerful it is to, to basically develop these networks in order to basically track carbon in a city, in order to basically be able to identify where the carbon is, is coming in. But I think that um, if we really want to, to make progress, we, go, we, we need to go a bit beyond this very, very powerful uh, approach that they are, they are taking and uh, really to, to develop what I would call really an urban carbon cycle, understanding all the component of the carbon cycle, the carbon budget inside an urban area. And we know that carbon is entering in cities, not as CO2, but as fossil fuel, as food, as a, a construction material, as paper, whatever. And the city is a processor, it processes those input and removed uh, or export waste on the one hand, but also uh, uh, let CO2 uh, emitted uh, into, into the atmosphere through what we call the vertical flux. And so um, it, it seems to me that in order to be able, of course, to, to take the most powerful action that will bring us to conditions 
close to what COP uh, requires, uh, an understanding of this uh, entire budget and how it function is crucial. And so uh, measurements, of course, help, but we, we need to be uh, as integrative as, as possible. And I was happy to listen earlier to, to the presentation by, by Lucy uh, Rutira, who, who was really saying, you know, what we need is observations, but also we need uh, a priori emission inventory that need to be put together. We need models to, to digest the uh, information that we get from, from uh, the experimental side. And then we need, of course, to uh, compare what happens between cities to, to see what actions are the most appropriate. So the networking development is, is very important. I would add that in addition to the, the, the monitoring, the, 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 the constant monitoring, having once in a while uh, intensive field campaign to see, for example, what are the plumes that get out of the city, how much CO2 is exported is, is important. And because the city plays a such large role into the emission on the, on the global scale, having those information, uh, not just in Glasgow, but in many cities of the world, and Glasgow can be, of course, a, a wonderful, like Berkeley is already, a wonderful uh, example or, or, or kind of a, a show the way to other cities that would be, of course, extremely useful to, to get, to, you know, to put this, the city, the contribution of the city into a global perspective that uh, allows us to, to really understand local budget and how the local carbon budget affects the global uh, budget of CO2. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that, Guy. And the, the uh, final contribution from the this first initial question of the roundtable panel, uh, I'll turn to, to Ron now. Ron, we've heard a lot about the technology uh, today and the one of the barriers traditionally has been the cost of, of uh, sensor networks. I wonder if you could say a bit more about the cost. You touched on this a little bit in your, your talk, but also the trajectory that we might be on in terms of, of, of the costs. So, <clears throat> So I put some numbers in, in my talk, but let me uh, try it here to just put that in context. So I, I think you could blanket a city in sensors about every two kilometers for roughly the same cost as one air quality monitoring station in that city. Yeah. So lots and lots of cities have six or eight air quality monitoring sites. Um, so for a small fraction of that capital investment, you could blanket a city in these sort of uh, low cost dense networks. But you know, as we've heard in this conversation already, the, the measurements themselves are a, a small piece of the total cost of uh, using those measurements. And so we, we heard about an, the, the educational component of, you know, what are we gonna, you know, we've put in here in California and in Glasgow, we're gonna put the measurements on the rooftops of schools. So we have an opportunity to use those observations to inspire the next generation of students who might be thinking about this. That won't happen with people who were passionate about teaching. And uh, we heard a lot about communication between the scientific observations and people who are thinking about economics and policy. And that won't happen without people who were passionate about translating the, the numbers at each location into information that's useful to someone who's making a choice between two alternative policy. So the real costs of this are the people in, in those spaces, the teaching and communication. So there's a core minimum of about two people per year and maybe it's two individuals or maybe it's you know five individuals a quarter of their time uh, in getting the information from the numbers at each sensor to something useful to people. But then as you can see here, we have a hundred people on this conference call today who are all engaging. And just so a hundred people for half a day is, you know, that's already a lot of time. And so we're, you know, you know there are a lot of people who wanna engage in this conversation in all kinds of ways. And so I, I think, you know, that, that will be the real cost and the real opportunity is how the measurements and our ability to communicate about those measurements allow people to do their work differently and better and bring their energy from uh, their part of the conversation uh, together in new ways. 
So, um, you know, let me just remind you a, a couple other things. Uh, why cities? Right now, about half the people on our planet live in cities. You know, if, if it's not half today, it's half in the next 10 or 15 years. So cities are where we're going to solve the, the, the carbon problem on our planet. And so we can't forget that. Um, Kirsty asked um, what the Glasgow emissions were as a fraction of Scotland. I'll point out that someone in the Q&A answered her question. So if you want to know the emissions from the different uh, Scottish cities, uh, the answer to that question is there posted for you in, with numbers for each one and what we currently think. Um, and, uh, you know, let me close by saying we have this, you know, it's come up a number of times and it's key, this con conversation between the greenhouse gases and air quality and the, and the consequent public health of poor air quality is a, a very important piece of the conversation. And we didn't talk about that in terms of what our network can deliver, but we think it's an absolutely crucial part, both of the conversation about greenhouse gases and the conversation about air quality. And so I, I look forward to working with folks in Glasgow uh, on both of those issues as we go forward together. Great, well, thanks very much, uh, Ron. So I have a question here, and I'm not sure who's going to be best placed to answer it. Um, maybe Duncan, maybe Ken, possibly Kirsty, I don't know. Uh, so the first, it actually comes from a colleague of mine, but I won't mention his name. Um, he's always asking me difficult questions, so I'll, I'll pose this question to you. Are there any concrete examples of where cities have bypassed national governments to put forward and acted upon green recovery plans? In other words, can cities act on their own, basically overriding government, uh, working against... Duncan has come in. Well done, Duncan. Thank you. I'll say something there. Um, from my experience, Alistair, of working actually with other colleague cities in the United States. Um, I think one of the ironies of recent history has been that whilst the federal government had withdrawn or was intending to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, in many ways the United States probably would, was en route to meet many of its unsigned for commitments because of the activities of cities like New York, Los Angeles and, and states like California. Uh, and one of the interesting issues, we, we're about to sign a partnership agreement uh, this week with Pittsburgh. Um, and the Mayor Bill Peduto of that city has been a leading uh, American mayor in, in pushing for carbon and climate issues across the United States. Uh, one of the things that's been very noticeable to me is the extent to which, whilst a city like Pittsburgh or New York uh, at times may have felt that it was not receiving as much support as it would have wished from national government, um, nevertheless, using the powers available to mayors and using those city uh, ordinances that they may have, I think they've begun to push towards that greener, cleaner model and with it a recovery from COVID that's based upon the, 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 the kind of green recovery principles. It's probably a bit too early to say what all that might mean for many of the cities. Uh, but if you look at one of the other partner cities that we've got in Glasgow, Santiago, Chile, which is which was to have been the COP25 host, you know, they should have deployed around 800 electric buses by the end of this year. Uh, some of the municipal, some of them with the private sector. And it's that model of governance that I think for me is really interesting. I, I often say that whilst technological innovation of the sort we've been discussing today is absolutely vital, it's innovation in governance and how we arrange ourselves in our cities that's just as, just as important. When you look at cities around the world and how they, they take up powers or exercise the powers they already have, it, it's fascinating to see how they can achieve that. A city like Glasgow, middle of the 19th century, took power through a statute at Westminster to build uh, the Loch Catron works, uh, which brought clean water to this city and ended some of the, some of the, uh, uh, some of the diseases uh, through, through poor water that we had in Glasgow. That was a feat of engineering. And it was also a feat of political will. And it's that kind of combination I think we're looking for now from many of our cities. I would just finally say, especially with Kirsty being on the call, um, what a difference it makes to have a supportive national framework, which we're very fortunate to benefit from in Glasgow and the other cities. And um, that's not always a conversation that, that can be had when I, I talk to other peer cities from across the UK, south of the border. Great. Uh, Ken, I see you've unmuted yourself. Would you like to come in? Yeah, quickly. Um... Most California cities have climate action plans, which are individual to their jurisdiction. Um, and of course, uh, most of you are familiar with C40 and ICLEI. Both of those are city organizations with very aggressive plans 
uh, well beyond most national governments, I would say right now, and certainly true in the US. Um, and that's true at a subnational state level uh, through things like the Enver 2 coalition. So I think, you know, most of it, it, I think it's been estimated that 70% or more of the activity to reduce emissions is at the city level. So uh, absolutely the answer uh, is yes. And I want to make one other quick observation. Um, it, you know, we've been talking mostly about ground-based sensors uh, for cities. Um, California is engaged uh, with uh, Planet Labs uh, private company and JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab, which is part of, uh, connected to NASA for a satellite uh, program, which uh, should be up and running with low orbit satellites in about 18 months or so, uh, which will generate uh, point source data for methane emissions um, and apparently can also do some thing, uh, similar things with CO2. So if you start to combine these two sets of networks, uh, cities are gonna have a huge amount of data to be able to take some very specific action. So I wanted to get that into the mix as well. Great, thanks, thank, thanks very much. If there's no one else wants to come in on this question, I, I do have another one here. And again, I'm not absolutely sure who's going to be best placed to answer this one. This is to do with imported goods and services. So I think the, the notion here is that um, you know, cities may be importing a lot of material, but there's a lot of greenhouse gas being generated to, um, to, to create these goods and services. So the question is, are you aware of whether imported goods and services, in addition to direct energy consumption, impact on greenhouse gas emissions? And are you aware of any cities monitoring this aspect of, city, of the city impact on the environment? The, the, I, I'll okay. just mention I'll just mention real quickly that San Francisco is uh, focused very much on uh, se sector three here as, as we think about it. Yeah, I mean, what, one of the things that uh, and I, I, I believe that I haven't actually seen the questions, but I understand there's quite a lot of questions coming in about the, the developing world and greenhouse gases in the developing world. And so we've talked about San Francisco, Glasgow and so on part of the Bay Area and Glasgow, um, but clearly there's a lot of greenhouse gases being uh, generated uh, in the in developing countries. And I, I wonder if anyone's got any thoughts on the kind of monitoring that might be happening there and whether the kind of low cost technologies we're talking about here today would be appropriate. Yeah, so maybe one point on this, there, there are a number of projects to look both at air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions uh, by deploying uh, uh, low-cost sensors. Uh, for example, uh, one of the projects that I'm involved in uh, by the World Resource Institute is to look at cities in the developing world, in particular India, also Africa, and, and so on. Of course, uh, what is crucial in this case is the capacity building. I mean, uh, we can bring in the technology, we can uh, try to establish networks, but you need people to run those networks. And so uh, having uh, support and funding for uh, capacity building is, is crucial in, in this kind of, of uh, you know, uh, action that, that, are, that are taken. And it's, it's not easy to do because Nobody is really supporting that in a, in a very uh, strong way. So what would be really interesting is to have cities like Glasgow or other cities in the developed world having a sister city uh, somewhere in the world and working together with them and, and having you know, part of the equipment uh, being uh, installed in, in this part of the world and people coming and learning uh, in, in our cities, what's happening. So, so we need to think about the capacity building the education of the people who can then uh, run the system uh, in, in a sustained way. Alistair, can I just add something to that, please? Um, yeah, please, please I just do. want to say one of the intentions for COP26 is that the developed countries of the world should honor a prior commitment to provide $100 billion in climate finance for the developing world. Uh, and that is something that will have to be brought to the table for the negotiations between nation states. And I think that's really significant. If I could make a call out as well for another key local university asset at Glasgow Caledonian University, we're very fortunate to have something called the Centre for Climate Justice, 
which was founded by Mary Robinson with the aim of supporting conversations about how to make a just transition to a safer world. And for us, that's a really significant resource. And in terms of what Guy was saying and linking to other nations uh, and cities around the world, and, and Kirsty will know this from the Scottish government's work on climate justice as well, I think we, we're in a position where we would very much wish to be advocating for that as part and parcel of, of COP26. One final point there, the leader of the council this week will speak at an ICLEI Africa event co-hosted by the government of Rwanda. Uh, I'm very conscious that we've displaced COP27 from a city and a nation on the continent of Africa through to 2022, and we will want to support the UK government's presidency uh, in, in linking that to COP27 in Africa from Glasgow and COP26. Alistair, can I also come in? Yeah, just please a, come in. Yeah. A, a quick note uh, in terms of trying to get this um, information out to the, uh, the wider world. So the the World Meteorological Organization does have an initiative called the, uh, the Integrated Greenhouse Gas Information System, IGIS, uh, which is heavily involved in trying to promote the use of atmospheric observations um, across nations um, and also focused on cities, point sources uh, and nation emissions of, so, uh, of all greenhouse gases. So there is there are initiatives there, um, you know, but um, again, Funding is always an issue. So the WMO are trying to link funding uh, sources with um, these sort of uh, countries of the willing who are interested in developing these um, uh, networks. But the transfer of information or the transfer of, of knowledge um, is really important. So getting local people to run the networks and to interpret the data themselves is really key. Yep. Kirsty, do you want to go in? Will you unmute yourself, please? Kirsty, can you unmute yourself, please? There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Unmuted now. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so just to just echo uh, Duncan's point around um, climate justice and, and the importance uh, of that to the, the, the Scottish Government and, and Scotland. So we were, um, I think, one of the first governments to set up a climate justice fund that directly supported um, people in developing country. And some of that is around capacity building. I don't think on, on measurement, um, but, but, but to be able to, to, to manage and adapt to climate change, because we all know the impact that that has on developing countries are, is much, much bigger than in, in developed countries and it impacts the, the most vulnerable. So and I, I must say I was I was really struck by, by the idea of um, working with you know you know cities in, in developing countries. So in Scotland we've got a number of historical partner countries. We tend to focus in Africa, countries like um, like Malawi that we have long uh, historical ties with. We're actually doing quite a lot um, of capacity building in the water sector with them to help identify um, water resources and which will need to be managed better. I mean it's a different sector but I think it's just another example of where you can you know tri triangulate and actually do exactly what Duncan is talking about but you know with, with these parties is, is bringing in and supporting and um, developing countries to to you know to, to measure and manage the impact on their their cities. Thanks very much uh, for that, uh, Kirsty. Uh, stimulated a lot of interesting uh, discussion. Um, we have another question here, which um, uh, I guess is probably either um, directed at, at Ron or possibly Guy. Um, and this is about extending the um, greenhouse uh, gas measurement capability to include community science participation like the Purple Air Network. I mean, is, is that feasible, possible, desirable? So, Ron, you might want to answer that, but let me just tell you that uh, in Germany, where I'm sitting now, um, there is a, a, a large network that's a good example of citizen science about aerosols, which are, you know, uh, one of the pollutants, uh, also have some impact on, 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 the, on, on the climate uh, forcing. And so they are, you know, the, it was very interesting because the, the, some of the people didn't really believe the, the quality of the data coming up from government institution, med services, et cetera, they wanted to measure themselves. But more importantly, it was also to push people to become aware of the problem, interested in the problem. And you have now thousands of people who have on their house or in their garden or near uh, where they live, 
they have a sensor that they build themselves to learn really what a sensor is. So it's mostly an educational purpose. This network started in Germany, I think in Stuttgart, is now European wide, and they have station now installed in the US and, and other places. So it seems to me that, you know, we might not gain scientifically much more than what we already know, although that's to be proven, but it is a, a big uh, exercise if you want to, to become aware, to, to become engaged in this and to and train a number of people in becoming uh, really aware and concerned about the problem. And they discover a lot of things by doing their measurements. It's, they, they, it's a group of people, there's a community building. Citizen science is going to grow very much. It's very important already in Europe, but it's coming everywhere in the world. And so I think it's important. Yes, I'll just reiterate that I think, you know, here this uh, small company Purple Air, which has connected itself now to one of the weather companies, uh, is selling aerosol sensors at a price point where uh, thousands and thousands of people are putting them in their homes. And every time we have a major fire in California, more show up in the, in the last set of fires, three people on my street added a Purple Air sensor. So the density of those is now, you know, where our dense network for CO2 is every two kilometers, these aerosol sensors are probably every tenth of a kilometer. So you get, you know, an immediate uh, complete map. Uh, I, I live at the top of a hill at um, 400 meters. The, uh, when the smoke was coming over, over the hill, at the top of the, at the 400 meter point, we were in the smoke layer and people down at sea level were in clean air. So you see all kinds of details that you, you couldn't possibly get with a, a widely spaced network. And it's really, it's bringing people a connection to the air around them in a, in a way that's fundamentally different that you can only get when you have a detailed map or a, you know, a comprehensive satellite picture. It's like the evening news where you can see the clouds go by all day you can now see that in what's otherwise invisible gases. And that, that, those kind of images are gonna change how we engage with the air. And uh, I hope that we get to that point for CO2. We're not, we're not there yet, but there will be strong synergies between what we do with you know, what we're calling a dense network every two kilometers and the much, much denser networks of what we can do for aerosol today because the aerosol sensors are so much less expensive. A good aerosol sensor, the, the key part is twenty dollars. Great, I've got uh, a question um, for Graham. This is a question from me, Graham. You'll be glad to hear. So, Graham, we've, we've heard about the cost of the um, implementing uh, a dense net uh, sensor network uh, for cities. Uh, what would you argue is the economic upside of that investment? What, what are the the economic benefits? of installing something, of monitoring your greenhouse gases and, and controlling and perhaps reducing your greenhouse gases? I think, well, I think the very first response I would give to that is, is, is a cost relative to what? So what's your baseline? And I think a large part of the way we've framed the climate change discussion has been relative to where we are just now. But actually, if you're thinking about the actual costs and you actually need to think about the future and the potential cost of doing nothing. And once you start to frame it in that conversation, then the what we call as the, the opportunity cost suddenly starts to flip around. So I think, yes, there's upfront investments, but once you start to think about the, the long-term costs of not making these investments, then these net, uh, these net benefit, cost-benefit analysis turn around and start to become positive. So I think, that, I think that's, that's the, the quick answer to that. I think there's also then, I think, once you start getting into the strategic responses, and this is where you know, cities like Glasgow have got a real opportunity in all of this, is, is how do you embed these conversations that we're having here about the vision of Glasgow into the future? And if you can start to create a narrative and a really strong narrative about about Glasgow's being a city that is at the front end of the transition to net zero, but the front end of, of air quality and the like, you start to then be able to embed that in your discussions around what's your economic strategy for your city. So it's how do you attract people to come and live and work in your city? 
You know, in a post-COVID world, cities are going to be in number of enormous pressure in terms of their ability to, to um, encourage people to come and live, to think about the future within a city environment. So if you can get ahead of the curve and you can create a positive narrative about your local city and why people should come and live in your city, then there's real opportunity, real economic opportunities for places like Glasgow. And I think that's where Glasgow is, is stealing a march in many ways. And I think that, that has to be really supported and encouraged. And I think the crucial point to that, and Duncan's touched on this already, is that the stuff that we're talking about here has to be integrated into everything that's done across the city, from economic development through to what it's planning on transport, through what it's planning on measurement around air quality, through to day-to-day -day economic development. And I think if you can link all of that, then you've got a really powerful narrative and story to tell that turns the questions you're raising, Alison, about cost into actually questions about benefits. Great. Well, I see that the clock is now, um, well, 19.40 here. We're 40 minutes past the hour, and that's our allotted time. Um, before I hand over to Tom to say some uh, concluding remarks, I think I would just like to say some concluding remarks uh, of my own. First of all, thanking all the speakers for the, their participation in this session. Uh, thank you to all the people who've been putting in questions. We haven't managed to get nearly answers to uh, all of the different questions that have been coming in. We will try to do follow up with that uh, under the, uh, after the event. <clears throat> I'd like to thank all the speakers uh, uh, that, that uh, participated uh, earlier today. And a particular thanks to the people who've been, the team who've been uh, setting this uh, event up, the organizing committee, and a particular thanks to uh, Claire um, for all the work that she has uh, uh, put into this. Claire will be leaving us very, uh, soon. Uh, Claire is off to put her um, five-year-old, or she's a six-year-old now, uh, uh, to bed. So you've got to get your priorities right, uh, Claire. So thank you very much indeed for all your uh, participation and help today. So uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll hand over to uh, Tom, who's to say the concluding remarks. Hello, Tom. Oh, yeah, Tom has just said, hope to see you all in person a year from now. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> um, I don't know what's happened to, to Tom. There we go. Ah, I hope that I'm unmuted now, I assume. Yeah, yeah. And, okay, very uh, good. <laughs> I'd like to add my thanks to those expressed by Alistair. Tom, and in particular, Tom, I'd like I can't to see you, Tom. Tom, can you put your video on? Okay, uh, I have uh, the shared screen. Can you see the shared screen? Oh, okay, maybe I'm somewhere else, okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> in particular, I'd like to thank Alistair Ferguson and Claire McLaren from the University of Strathclyde and also Duncan Booker from the city of Glasgow for being instrumental in organizing this webinar. Okay. <laughs> I don't know about all of you, but I, I'm very much looking forward to next year. Uh, hopefully we will all meet in person in Glasgow next November, and we will hear about meaningful progress we have made toward meeting the goals of the Paris Accord. I believe we can achieve these goals by working together to determine the best path forward to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and address the additional challenge of improving urban air quality. I assure you that the members of OSA and AGU are committed to supporting you in the challenging years and decades ahead by supplying the information you need to make informed decisions. Uh, we are eager to hear from you how we can help. If you are interested in further information about the GEM initiative and the Urban Greenhouse Gas Program, please contact us at geminitiative at osa.org. Thank you for your time today, and I hope you and your colleagues and families all stay safe and healthy. Thank you again. Right, thank, thanks very much, Tom, and goodbye, everyone. Uh, safe travels, whatever you are. <laughs> <laughs>